there and go to Malachi and then go to Proverbs and who knows where we'll go from there. Go home, I guess. Be back again tonight. Romans chapter 15. We have a verse that's going to, uh, I guess, not back up, but uh, I'm trying to look for a word there that justifies, I rather, justifies what we're going to do. In Romans 15, you have it? Verse number 4 says, whatsoever things were, what's the word? Written. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Our Father, help us today as we look at your scriptures that we may find that hope that you're telling us here in this verse. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're living in dark days, aren't we? And uh, I've never seen days like this and uh, the days could get darker. But thank God we're children of light. And we don't have to walk in darkness. In fact, if you do walk in darkness, the Bible says over in 1 John, written to Christians, by the way, and the Bible tells us that if we walk in darkness, uh, that we, we better be careful if we're walking in darkness. We don't have the light of God in us. Now, Jesus loves us, and he saved us, and he gave us that light, but sometimes it is possible for a child of God to walk in darkness, and I'll tell you why. Because when that, when that child of God fails to have a personal Bible study of his own. Not just what the preacher tells you on Sunday morning and that's it. But if you fail to get in this book, you're going to walk in darkness. Amen. The scriptures give us light. Amen. So in Romans 4, uh, 15 verse number 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now we're going to look at something that was written aforetime. Malachi if you look at chapter number 3, Malachi chapter number 3, Israel, at the time of this writing, Israel was in dark times. This verse ends with the word curse. And the next 400 years, there is no light. There is no message from God. The next 400 years, it's, it's as though if God just drew the curtain back, or not drew it back, but closed the curtain. And he did not speak to Israel for 400 years through his prophets, through the word, or anything like that. Until in Matthew, the Bible tells us that there was a baby born in Bethlehem. And that baby was a child of light. In fact, he was that light, John tells us. And so for 400 years, Israel was in darkness. And uh, the last verse here is, uh, the last word in chapter number 4 is the word curse. And uh, we're going to see some things here as, as far as introduction is concerned about Malachi. Israel's in dark times, so are we. God said there were seven indictments against Israel. In chapter number one, the Bible says they doubted his love. Verse number two, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? If, if you want darkness to come in your heart, if you want darkness to come into your home or in the house of God, you just doubt God's love. There are so many people out there that are blaming God for their problems. That are blaming God for the condition that America's in. Listen, America has turned her back on God. And she can't blame anybody but her own self. And so there's a darkness that came upon the children of Israel because they doubted his love. Well, the second thing, they denied him his honor as a father. In chapter number one, if you look at verse number six, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If I be, if I then be, if then I be a father, where is mine honor? God took care of them. God brought them through the wilderness. God fed them with manna. God gave them water to drink when they were thirsty. But what you'll find here is they did not honor him as father, and uh, and, and so there was darkness in their life. And then there was a third thing, third reason why there was darkness. If you look at chapter number two and verse number fourteen. Their homes were without God. Their homes were without God. Chapter 2, verse 14. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. He, he said, husband, you better treat your wife right. How many women say amen right there? <laughs> now, I, I'm sure your husband does treat you right. At least he better. Yeah. He better or there will be darkness coming to that home. 
I promise you that. God said a man is to love his wife. Love his wife even as he loves himself. I haven't yet seen a man who didn't love himself. Can't pass by a mirror without looking at it long and hard. <laughs> if you love it yourself, you ought to love your wife even as you love yourself. Well, he got, he got to telling them about the darkness that were in their homes because they were treating their wives in a wrong way. And then verse number 17, chapter 2, verse 17, here's another reason why darkness came. There was no sensitivity of things which were wrong. It says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? <clears throat> you know what? Um, we know better. We know better. We're in a church. We're in a church that I, I think we preach the word of God. I think we follow the Bible as close as we possibly can. But I'm going to tell you what. There's people out there that does not know the difference in right and wrong. They're, they're, bring, they're being brought up that way. They're just some things that are right. I don't have to give you a verse on that. I don't have to give you a rule on that. Then there's some things that are wrong. But I, I, th th there's people that, especially at this younger generation, it's coming up, they, they, have no, they have no idea of what's right and what's wrong. If they think it's right, then it's right. If they think it's wrong, then it's wrong. And who are you to tell them what's right and what's wrong? <laughs> I remember a time, and, and it still goes for me, uh, that a man ought to give his seat to a lady. Well, what's the verse on that? I don't have a verse on that. It was just the right thing to do when I was growing up. I was taught that. I think it's the right thing to do. You don't give your seat to a lady, she might beat you up now. <laughs> Pretty tough ladies out there. But got some muscles, you know. But they were in dark times. No sensitivity of things which were wrong. There are just some things that are right in a church. There are just some things that are wrong. I don't have to give you a rule for that. It's just some things that are right and wrong. Amen? Here's another reason they were in darkness. Chapter 3, verse number 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Verse 10 said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me. Uh, now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not... Open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. They were robbing God in those days. You said, Pe people can't rob God. Come on, preacher. God said you could. Well, God owns everything. Nobody can rob him. God said you can rob him. You can rob him of the blessing that you ought to have. God wants to bless us, doesn't he? And when we, when we don't give like we should give, and I'm not preaching a sermon on give. Some of you here, you may be visiting for the first time. Oh, there's another one of them preachers preaching on my... No, I'm just telling you, there was darkness in their nation because they were robbing God. And God, can, can I just say this? God will never bless a stingy person or a stingy church. How is it that... that look, <clears throat> why is it that people give you a call... And they say, Preacher, I got an old piano I want to uh, donate to the church. I say, You got an old one? Do you have a new one? Yeah, we got just bought a new one. I said, We'll take that one. <laughs> Why do you want to give God your leftovers? Right. Why do people want to do that? Right. Poor old God. <laughs> <laughs> well, then darkness came, and then there's another reason. Verse number 14. There were days of discontented service. It says in verse 14, chapter 3, Malachi. It says, yet, he says, ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is in it that we have kept his ordinance? And that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. We're just not happy serving God. What's, what's, where's the payoff? What do I get out of serving God? What do I get out of going to church? What do I get out of giving and, and uh, praying? What, what good is there? They, they're just discontented. We're going to talk about contentment here in a little bit. But uh, Israel was in dark times. And these seven reasons why darkness came. But when you look at chapter number 3 of Malachi, verse number 16. Not everybody was in darkness. There were a few people. And uh, we call them a remnant. That really wanted to serve God. Look in verse 16. Then. Because of these seven things I just gave you. Then. There's a, he's going to change the thought here. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, 
And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Even in those dark days, there's a remnant. I'm, can I tell you this? We're living in dark days. We know that. But even in our dark days, there, everybody's not serving God. Everybody who claims to be saved is not saved. There's a remnant. I believe there's a remnant of people who profess Christianity. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He says, many, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. You know, so they're religious. They profess they know Lord. Lord, Lord. He said, um, haven't we cast out devils in thy name? In thy name, uh, done many wonderful works. Done many wonderful works, cast out devils and so forth. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Many, he says, are going to come to me in that day. I'm telling you, there's people who profess to know Jesus. I believe they're just a remnant that are saved. You say, the Baptist. No, look. I, there's, there's some Baptist preachers that I know. They think the only Baptists are going to heaven. They're wrong. If you've been born again, you're going to heaven. I don't care if you're Baptist or... You don't have any religion, any denomination at all. What was Paul? Paul was a child of God. There's only one Baptist that I read about in the book of God. That's John the Baptist. And you know, he got his head cut off. So it might be a dangerous thing to be a Baptist this day. A remnant. Even in these dark days, there's a remnant. A remnant is, listen, a remnant is residue. That which is left over after a separation, a removal, or a destruction of a part. Many professions, but only a remnant are saved. Many are on the broad road, few on that narrow road. Is that what the scripture says? Oh, everybody's going to heaven, preacher. No, they're not either. Everybody goes to church going to heaven. No, they're not. Everybody gets baptized. Everybody that's a Baptist going to heaven. No, they're not either. No. Jesus preached a message in John chapter number 6. And here's what the crowd said. They said, this is a hard message. <laughs> this is a rough sermon. And the Bible says that many of them walk no more with him. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, will you also go away? And you know the classic answer that Peter gave. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Many, many people. After Jesus preached it. And then there's the parable of the sower. Four types of ground. In fact, if you look at that parable, study that parable, one out of four were true believers. Oh, they just but our churches are full, not like they used to be. No. Well, what kind of people make this remnant? Well, the first thing he says in verse 16. Then Let's just look at this first part, and we'll look at the rest of it tonight here. Then they that feared the Lord. They that feared the Lord. Now, <clears throat> when Brother Bill started, when Brother Bill Ogle started the, studying the book of Proverbs, I think he made this statement, or somewhat like this statement. The theme of the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. That's, that's the theme of the book of Proverbs. And so, fear is not... It is not a, a cringing fear. It is a reverence and it is a respect for who God is. Amen. For who God is. And that's what he's going to talk about. Well, what kind of people fear the Lord? Let's go to the book of Proverbs and we'll park there for a little while, okay? Proverbs. Let's go to chapter number one. Proverbs chapter number one. What kind of people fear the Lord? What kind of people reverence him? What kind of people respect him for who he is? Well, people who fear the Lord are wise people. Are wise people. You may want to jot some of this stuff now beside the verse. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 7. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise what? Wisdom and instruction. Wise people. Have you come to that point in your life that you're wise? Not a wise guy, but wise. How do you become wise, preacher? 
Well, you take what you know from the book of God and apply it. Wisdom. Wisdom. I'm not just saying knowing facts about God or facts about the Bible or things like that. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about realizing who God is and he knows what's best. And we ought to take his counsel because he is wonderful and he is counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Have you come to that point in your life that you, that you would just acknowledge because you fear the Lord that God is all wise and we can trust him. Now there's some people I can't trust. There are organizations I can't trust. There certainly is a government that I cannot trust. And we're living in it right now. But how do you come to that place in your life? Wisdom of this world, the Bible says, is what? Foolishness with God. You can have all kinds of degrees and yet not have wisdom. What kind of people are those who fear the Lord? They're wise people. Let's look at chapter number 14. Here's another group of people. Wise people are, or, or uh, the, those who fear the Lord. Proverbs chapter number 14. If you'll look at verse, for once, I'm getting into Bill's message. Bill's been getting into mine, so I'm getting all into his today. Proverbs chapter number 14. Look at verse number 27. The fear... Yeah, I'll underline this. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. What does a fountain do? Just lay there or does it bubble up, spring up? Fountain. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. You go in that hallway on the right hand side is a water fountain. When you step on the, no, you don't step on anything, do you? you just push it, right? Uh, it tells you how much I use that. So you push it and that water comes up. All right. You don't go over to that and say, come on up. <laughs> you you got to put some action to that. But he says here, the fear of the Lord is, um, in verse number 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Look, th those people who fear God have a reverence for him, have a respect in him because of who he is. Not only they're wise people, but they're lively people. They're lively people. You know, we ought to be the most liveliest people on the face of this earth. We're lively people. But I'm afraid a lot of, <laughs> I'm afraid a lot of so-called Christians are what we used to call a bunch of deadheads. I mean, just dead. I've seen them dragging in church. They just come dragging in church. <laughs> what time is it? I wonder what time that preacher's going to get through. A bunch of, I'm, I'm just telling you, you say, boy, I, I like being with that lively crowd. You're here. You're here today. This is a lively crowd. Now, I got something going now, you know. He said, boy, that football statement, now that's a lively crowd. They don't get that way when they get home. They go home. You see, look, when they get home, they may shout a little bit for the favorite team that won the victory and all that. But they don't stay that way until the next game. <laughs> I'm telling you what, God's crowd's a lively crowd. Because we got one living in us that shall never die. Amen. Lively crowd. You say, preacher, are you lively? Well, sometimes I don't act that way. But I'm going to tell you what. I got one living in me that directs my life, directs my heart. I can go to him anytime. Lively crowd. You know what God said in, in uh, 1 Timothy 5, I think? That, that a woman that lives in pleasure is dead while she liveth. While she liveth. Lively crowd. God's crowd ought to be lively crowd. Some people get upset if a, if a brother or sister shouts a little bit. Man, what's he doing? Well, hey, maybe he got a little bit of life to him. Maybe you could use some of that. Amen. In fact, I got a sermon I'm going to preach on shouting. For those who don't believe in shouting. Y'all believe in shouting, don't you? I've heard you shout. Amen. See? <laughs> I've heard people shout. I've heard them shout. Look, look, I shout. Sometimes I'm driving down the road. God will bless me with something. And boy, I just shout spit all over the windshield. <laughs> My wife said, when are you going to clean that windshield? <laughs> I said, I, I'm just going to tell you something. i got something to shout about. Right. I'm not talking about showing off. I'm not talking about the. I'm just talking about God getting a hold of your heart and just squeezing the juices out of it. You, it's got to look. Every hot water heater ought to have a pop-off valve. 
If it don't, it'll, it will explode. Every now and then, God starts blessing you, you gotta pop off. Yeah. Ain't there a preacher called Peter Pop Off or something like that? I don't know where. <laughs> anyway, don't watch him. I know that much about it. Real life, real living is found in Christ. There's another crowd. <clears throat> There's another group of people that fear the Lord. Look at chapter 8. Chapter number 8. Chapter 8 of Proverbs. And if you look at verse number 13. Proverbs 8 verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Let me read that again. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You're not supposed to hate, preacher. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, God has a hate list over in Proverbs 1. But he says the fear of the Lord. You, you, you fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, if you reverence him, you have respect for him for who he is, then you're going to hate evil. I see a lot of evil in our time. And I hate it. I don't love evil. Do you? I don't want to be a part of it. He says you hate evil, pride, arrogancy. Well, I've never seen so much arrogancy as I've seen in the last few years. Arrogancy. And the evil way, the forward mouth do I hate. God's people, look, people that fear the Lord are a holy people. You know what? Holiness is one mark of walking with God. Now, I know what some people say. They say holiness is a denomination. Not really. Not really. Holiness, in fact, the word holy is found, <clears throat> found several times in the scripture. But in, in uh, the Old Testament, it means sacred. There's two words for holiness. One is in the Old Testament. One is Kodesh. Q-O-D-E-S-H. It's Kodesh. It simply means sacred or it means holy. And the other one is in the New Testament. It's Hagios and it means saint. Saint. You ever notice when Paul writes, he writes to the saints at Colossae, to the saints in Thessalonica, to the saints at Rome. Does that mean they were perfect? No, here's what it means. You put these two words together, here's what it means. It means they were different. They're different. Do you think Christians ought to be different than lost people? Huh? Sure they ought to be. How in this world are they recognizable without you having to say something to them? You heard about that guy? He took his, this guy, and he asked this Christian girl to go to the dance with him. And she said, well, my mom and dad really don't want me to, and the preacher don't really, really want me to. And she said, well, let me, let me check first. She said, preacher, you think I ought to go to dance with this fella? And he said, well, I'll tell you what you do. If you, you, go, you got your mind made up anyway, I can tell, because you wouldn't be asking me this. And... Uh, he said, do me a favor. I know you're going, but do me a favor. And she said, what's that? He said, witness to him when you go to the dance with him or whatever. So they were out on the dance floor and all this stuff. And uh, she says, uh, Henry, I got a question I want to ask you. And he said, what's that? She said, are you saved? Are you a Christian? He said, well, you know I'm not a Christian. He said, are you? She said, absolutely. He said, well, what are you doing here? God's people ought to be holy. Sometimes we'll look at a lady that's wearing a real long dress and have bob, bobbed hair and you say, that, that lady's holiness. That doesn't, that's not what that means. You're just different. You're just different. You act different. You talk different. You look different. That's what holiness means. You're just different. It's a healthy, happy, godly life. And by the way, if you're holy, you don't have to brag about it. You don't have to tell, you don't have to say, look at my Sunday school pen. It's dragging the floor. I've got one every Sunday. I haven't missed a Sunday for years. You don't have to do that. Look, if you're holy, you don't have to tell a soul. People will know if you walk with God or not. People can tell. Right? I think so. People tell if you walk with God. You put them together, it means different. We're supposed to be different. When you get saved, you have 
You still have your old nature, by the way, even when you get saved. Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about that. But when you get saved, you have a divine nature. And that divine nature of a believer is to live a holy life. Matthew tells us just to let your light, what? Shine. Look, I go to this light switch over here. I know I'm getting off. I go to this light switch off. Did you hear anything? Did you hear, did, did you hear that light said, I'm off? When you hit a light switch and the light comes on, I'm on. No, light doesn't do anything but shine. <laughs> That's what God wants us to do, shine. We're the light of this world. Just let your light shine. Just abide in Christ. You don't have to brag about how spiritual you are. Let me give you one more and we'll finish it up tonight. Well, people who fear the Lord are wise people. And they're lively people. And they're holy people. Now, I like this in chapter 14. Chapter 14. <clears throat> I want you to look at this. Chapter 14. If you look at verse number 26. See, we, we just read 27 just a minute ago. But I, I skipped this one. Uh, I skipped it for this, uh, this fourth thing I want to see here. Verse number 26. In the fear of the Lord is what? Strong confidence. And his children shall have a place of refuge. You know, if you fear God, you're optimistic. You're optimistic. By the way, you ought to read 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now that talks about dark times, but it talks about Jesus coming in those dark times. And I firmly believe this. I believe that the darker it gets, the nearer his coming. I like what Brother James said not too long ago. Somebody pointed out, well, that person's the Antichrist, and here's what he said. He said, I hope so. <laughs> because if he is, we're about to get out of here. I'm telling you, the darker it gets, the nearer I am to going home to be with my Savior. Optimistic. My nature is just me. My nature, I'm optimistic. I had a coach that was like that. I had a basketball coach, saved man. Gene Spadero was his name, Italian fella. He loved God. Had a real gruff voice. He said, all right, boys, let's get it. Let's get down the road. Let's go. And uh, I remember one time I, I fell down, skinned my knee, something. I had a floor burn like nobody's business on the basketball court. Man, I'm laying there and I'm hurting. He said, oh, there ain't nothing wrong with you. Get up, get up, get up, get up. Oh, there ain't nothing wrong with you. I'm optimistic. Somebody's sick, you know what I tell them? I don't say, I had an uncle die of what you got. I don't say that. That's pessimistic. I say, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Look, <clears throat> if you're saved and you're sick and you keep getting worse and worse and worse, you're going to be okay by the time this thing's over with. You're going to be with Jesus. I'm optimistic. Don't you hate to hang around pessimistic people all the time, complaining all the time? Christian, look, look, if you fear God, if you reverence Him, and you respect Him for who He is, man, you ought to be optimistic. We have so much going on for us as a child of God. I know this world's falling apart. I know this world is going to hell in the handbasket. But I'm not going with it. Amen. I'm not going with it. Darker gets, near His coming. Don't we have the joy of the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. I always say this, I'm t I know you're tired of hearing. But if you're happy, notify your face. <laughs> Don't we have the peace that passes all understanding? We belong to him. I'm, op I'm optimistic. I don't belong to the devil anymore. I'm not serving him anymore. I belong to Jesus. And I'm, I've read the, I, look, I've read the last chapter I read the last book we are winners Amen. in fact Paul says we're more than conquerors through him that loved us let me read first Thessalonians we'll come back to Proverbs tonight <laughs> first Thessalonians chapter number one verse number five first Thessalonians chapter one verse number five I want you to look at this Bible says for our gospel 
For our gospel, chapter 1, verse 5. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. What kind of people were they? They were optimistic people. We belong to Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to happen, lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. You ever try that? <clears throat> you ever stand in a public place and just start looking up? <laughs> and somebody's standing along the side of you and they're looking at you and then they start looking up and then pretty soon you got the whole piece. What are y'all looking at? I'm looking for Jesus. <laughs> you can talk about testimony, you can do that. What are you looking at? I'm looking for my redemption. It draweth nigh. And then the Bible says that we are to have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Now I'm going to stop right there. When I come back tonight, Lord willing, we're going to pick it up and we're going to show you that the Lord's people, the people who fear the Lord, are a contented people. Now it's a rare thing for people to be content. But if you fear the Lord, you realize Jesus is in you and he is your life, boy, that ought to make you more content than anything in this world. I'm contented. We'll look at that. We'll pick that up tonight. Give you the next four tonight, okay? Are you saved? Amen. If you're not saved, listen to me. If you're not saved, you probably have had no idea what I've just been talking about. But I'm going to tell you, if you fear the Lord, if you walk with him, you're going to be different. You're going to be holy. You're going to be optimistic. You're going to be wise. There are just some things that you're going to be that this world does not understand. I hope you'll come back tonight. We'll finish it up. Father, Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray, dear God, that today they would realize that they're lost sinners. They're not going to go to heaven in that shape. They'll die and go to hell without Jesus to be there for eternity. Father, it's not your will nor our will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Father, if there's one here tonight that needs, or today that needs to be saved, I pray that they'll step out of their seat and walk down this aisle. We'll take a Bible and show them how to be saved, how to have eternal life, how to go to heaven when this life is over. Father, would you save that one which is nearest hell? Reclaim the backslidden. Help us to fear you like we ought to. In Jesus' name, amen.